not long after I posted my video uh, with the example of Confucius consulting the I Ching, someone on Reddit asked a very valid question, uh, which I already had seen coming. Um, um, and, and he asked, in the video you recently posted, you mentioned that you were skeptical that Confucius actually used or endorsed the I Ching. Since this is a minority point of view, I'm wondering if you can outline your reasons for this skepticism. Um, yeah, of course I can do that. And in this video, I will mainly quote other sources, um, articles and books. Uh, so you might as well consider this a podcast. I don't think the visuals are really important here. So make yourself a cup of tea, go fold the laundry, um, take a bath, um, do whatever you like when you're listening to this. Um, because I'm mainly going to um, narrate what other um, scholars have said about this topic because this topic has already been studied for well the last 120 years at least i think um, so this isn't a, a, a new topic and my view of it isn't really exceptional and um, although this fellow member of Reddit says that it's a minority point of view that I'm holding. Uh, that depends on which sources you are following. Um, because if you're following the traditional view of the I Ching, yeah, definitely, then this saying that Confucius wasn't involved with the I Ching, didn't study the I Ching, or didn't consult it, that's definitely a minority point of view. Um, because the traditional view still holds that Confucius um, com uh, compiled the Ten Wings, uh, etc. Et but I am more affiliated with the academic world, and in the academic world, this isn't really a mi minority point of view. Um, and as we will see in a moment, um, Richard Rudd actually also says that, that the, 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 the view that Confucius uh, wasn't involved with, with the I Ching, that's actually uh, the, the most um, followed view uh, at the moment. So anyway, um, saying that Confucius wasn't involved with the I Ching, that I think that started at least somewhere with the Doubting Antiquity movement somewhere in the 1920s, I think, um, with the Gu Shibian by Gu, uh, Gu Jiegang. And um, this article in the Gu Shibian from Li Jiangchi. And this, th there are a few chapters in the Gu Shibian which deal with Confucius and his involvement with the with the I Ching. So, and this section about Confucius starts with, in, the, in the typical um, voice or tone of most articles in the Gu Shibian. It, it, some people might consider it rude or harsh. Um, I find it actually quite uh, refreshing, this tone, but I, I'm not going to translate it. I'm just going to paraphrase it, what Li Jingchi says at the beginning of his article on the uh, involvement of Kongzi and the I Ching, Confucius and the I Ching, um, about this connection between Kongzi and the I Ching, he says that it's uh, already from the Western Han Dynasty until the, uh, the end of the Qing Dynasty. For 2000 years, people have uh, followed this idea and all scholars um, also um, followed that idea and didn't really dare to oppose that view because 
he says we are talking about the greatest sage of all times. And even though, and I found this <laughs> quite funny uh, expressions, even though Beatles were gnawing at uh, its beard and mice were making holes in it, the golden statue still remains and the devotees were endless, continuing endlessly. So, and even though between them there might be one or two madmen <laughs> who proposed to destroy this temple, in the end their world, words were empty, meaningless, and they didn't really have any influence. And that is what Li Jing Chu says. So, already the tone is set here if, uh, in the, the, the Gu Xibian, in this article from Li Jing Chu. Um, Immediately, he, he says that he will show that Confucius wasn't involved with the I Ching and the um, authorship of the Ten Wings, etc. So this idea that Confucius wasn't really um, doing anything with the, with the I Ching, that's not really new. And actually, Richard Rudd sums it up quite nicely. So this is just what, what I'm going to read now is simply from uh, Richard Rudd's book uh, and if you don't have it you should definitely purchase it because he also tells about this specific topic on Confucius and the Zhao Yi he says in the time of Confucius the Zhao Yi was still regarded as a divination manual Confucius insisted he did not concern himself with spirits and divination and Richard Rudd refers to that section from the Analects, from the Lun Yu. Yet some writers claim that Confucius knew and admired the book. This idea, which was current for a thousand years, depended on a single sentence in the Analects, the collection of sayings that is our only source for Confucius' teaching. In Legge's translation of Analects um, 7, uh, paragraph 16, this sentence reads, if some years were added to my life, I would give 50 to the study of the Yi, and then I might come to be without great faults. The Lu text of the Analects, now preferred by most scholars, has the word Yi written with another character of the same sound, meaning not change, so not referring to the Yi Jing, but uh, meaning also or more and more. <laughs> more about this other character later. Um, this makes the sentence mean, if I were given a few more years so that I might spend a whole 50 in study, I believe that after all, I should be fairly free from error. And uh, Rudd says that this is likely to be the correct reading of that specific sentence. And we will talk more about that sentence later because that has actually been the topic of several studies in the West and as well as in, uh, in China. Some writers believe that another sentence in the Analects proves that Confucius knew the Zhao Yi. They hold that because or Oracle um, 32, line 3, so Hexcom 32, not fixing the power of an augury will lead to failure, that is Rudd's translation. That same sentence is also found in the Analects. So these um, uh, writers, they say that because of that Confucius must have known the Zhao Yi and quoted from it. The Analects paragraph is, the master said, the man of the South have a saying, a man without fixity will not make a shaman healer. How right, not fixing the power of an augury will lead to failure. The master said, they do not simply read omens. And this passage deals explicitly with the popular saying from the south. The same proverb was probably quoted in both the Analects and the Zhao Yi independently. The coincidence does not provide satisfactory evidence that Confucius knew the Zhao Yi. Sir Machen's charming story in his biography of Confucius in Shuji, um, 
chapter 47 about the leather thongs of Confucius' copy of the I Ching wearing out because he loved the book so much is equally to be distrusted. It comes from the time when the Zhao Yi had been elevated to the status of Confucian classic and legends were beginning to accrue. The same is true of the words attributed to Confucius in a satirical passage of Zhuang Zhe, book 14, where he says that he has studied I Ching for many years, and equally of the praise of I Ching uttered by Confucius in Li Ji, Records of Rights, section 23. I didn't bother to look up these references, uh, because if I would have done that, this video would take several weeks in the making, if I would have to look up all um, references. So this is just a bit a quick and dirty research, if you can call it research. There is in fact no reliable evidence that Confucius either knew or did not know the book. From what we know of his approach to divination and spirits, he would have taken little interest in Zhao Yi. And there is no trace either of his typical teachings anywhere in Zhao Yi, nor or of Zhao Yi in any of his known sayings and writings. Since in his lifetime the book was almost certainly extant in only one copy or very few copies, kept by the Zhao diviners, there is little likelihood that he would have seen it or known what was in it. And he, um, Richard Rudd is quoting Homer Dubs, uh, or referring to Homer Dubs' article, Did Confucius Study the Book of Changes? And if you go to look for it, I'm sure you can download it on the internet. So, and Homer Dubs is actually even quite stronger in this view that Confucius didn't study the I Ching. Homer Dubs says, and this is from his article, the attitude of Confucius himself to religious observances, as we find it in the Analects, is quite out of harmony with the supposition that he put great value upon divination and the Book of Changes. He preserves a complete silence as to both of them, except in this one saying that Rudd also mentioned. Confucius' comment upon ancestor worship was, if you cannot serve the living properly, how can you serve the dead? And if you do not know life, how can you know about death? Such sayings would not come from a man who is vitally interested in the interpretation of divination. Uh, and that's because divination was associated with ancestors and ancestor worship, etc. As for prayer, he holds it is useless. The just punishment of heaven cannot be averted by any prayer. So he rejects prayer for the sick. A righteous life is the only true prayer, and particular petitions in time of trouble should not be offered. If prayer is useless, says Howard Dubs, how can divination be useful? And actually, Dubs has a very valid point here, because, um, as you might remember from my first example video, um, the statements that were addressed to the oracle were often seen as some sort of prayer uh, or at least a wish that you would like to see fulfilled. So, um, so it's this idea of prayers, if Confucius didn't really think prayers were valuable, then that would also render any oracle uh, useless so, in the book of history, which Confucius studied and probably revised, we find the statement, divination, when fortunate, may not be repeated. Such a statement implies that intelligent men previous to the time of Confucius had not taken a wholly credulous attitude towards divination. A Confucius attitude towards the popular religion was clearly one of agnosticism refusing to attack it, but also refusing to do more than go through the prescribed ritual and clearly indicating that he did not accept the religious superstitions which lay behind those practices. So what Dubs is actually saying is that the, the, what we know of Confucius 
um, and his views of spirits and ancestors and, um, well, divination. It doesn't really correspond with um, the contents of the Zhao Yi and how the book was used in his time. So, um, because of that, Dubs and many other scholars believe that Confucius didn't really study the I Ching. Um, not all scholars, modern scholars, um, hold that view. There are still scholars who believe that Confucius did study the I Ching and that he was involved with the composition, um, the assembly of the Ten Wings. So, for instance, this article from Xiao Fang Rao, which was published in 2012, um, says that Confucius did indeed study the I Ching, but that this phrase about these 50 years should actually be translated or, uh, or read as this. If some years were added to my life, I would give five or ten, so not fifty, but five or ten, to teaching of the I Ching. And then it might come to be without great faults. And um, Chao Van Rao actually says that um, this quote, this, this paragraph from uh, the Analects, means that uh, Confucius um, wanted to teach the I Ching uh, to prevent ministers um, at, at the court from making grave mistakes. So it's not about himself making mistake, uh, preventing uh, these mistakes, but it's about other people. Uh, he wants to he wants to teach the I Ching to help them prevent grave mistakes. So. Um, and, and that is what he says at the end of this translated abstract. He says that this chapter means, this paragraph means that if some years were added to Confucius' life, probably five or ten years, and uh, he uses the extra lifetime to teach students the profound contents of the Book of Changes, and that he could almost modify the social problems of the Zhao dynasty on that time because Confucius lived at the end of the Zhao dynasty, the very end. And um, Zhao Feng Rao is not the only scholar who still believes that Confucius studied the I Ching. It's still working from this specific sentence about the 50 years of studying the, the I Ching. Uh, Cheng Wang says that it should be read as that Confucius st started studying the I Ching when he was 50 years old. That's what it actually says here in the abstract. So, um, this author also believes that Confucius was studying the, the I Ching. And he says here, actually it means... Whoa, sorry. whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Always difficult writing on the screen. It says, given several years, I will be 50 years old. If I study the Book of Changes from now on, I can avoid making grave mistakes. And something in my mind tells me that this was actually um, one of the rules in Japan uh, when Japan turned to Confucianism. Um, I believe there was this rule that you were only allowed to study the I Ching when you were 50 years or older. So, and, and I think that was based on this specific sentence from the Analects. Now, I might be wrong here, but something in my mind tells me that this was actually the case in Japan, that you were only allowed to study the I Ching when you were 50 years or older. But anyway, that's a different topic. Um, David Sheeler translated the, the Analect, the discussions, conversations, the Lun Yu, from, um, which is supposedly written by the students of Confucius' later generations. 
and he spent almost um, 13 pages um, on this specific quote. Um, and he translates this sentence as uh, adding some other material to it from, from, from commentaries. He says that sometime after Confucius was recalled to the city-state of Lu, the master said, if several more years were to be added to my life, I would have had 50 years in which to study changes. Then I should have been free from major errors. Dako. Now, I'm not going to read everything from these pages. I'm giving, going to give you all the pages from um, Schiller's commentary. So if you want to read everything, just pause the video. I think that should work. Mainly the, the, the points that I made green, I found these interesting. Uh, so I'm just going to read that for you. As Lee points out, I'm not sure who Lee is, but that's no doubt somewhere mentioned in the bibliography. As Lee points out, Da Guo, major errors or great transgressions in the, this, um, this quote from, from the intellects, is the title of Hexagon 28 in the I Ching, which is composed of the compliance tri trigram, alternate, alternately meaning to be committed to, uh, on the bottom, and the rejoice trigram, Dway, trigram lake, alternately meaning lake or youngest daughter at the, at the top of this hexagram. This coincidence is supposed to definitely link this analect with hexagram 28 in the changes. So the fact that Confucius talks about Dagwo, which most of the time means grave or serious errors, um, because it's also the name of Hexam 28. Uh, some scholars also say, well, that's definitely proof that um, Confucius studied uh, the I Ching. Um, to make things more confusing, Wang Bi, more than 700 years after Confucius understands Da Guo to mean highly superior or surpassing, while the Ma Wang Dui version has Xiao Guo, small or few, deficient, plus highly superior, surpassing, meaning very far from the use of these characters in this analect, where the phrase means major errors. So um, this is also uh, a point the, that is often used to link Confucius with the, the, with the Zhao Yi, although you, don't will, will, you, will, you will not read it very often, this, this point about Hexum 28. On the surface, Confucius' interest in changes as an ancient divination text would hardly seem to make much sense in a man so opposed to treating of things that are beyond the comprehension of human beings. But the claim made by the ancient commentators is that the master spent so much time studying the changes that the leather thongs holding the text together had to be replaced three times. This ancient text would have been written on strips of bamboo or a similar kind of wood, held together by leather tongs and into which characters were cut by using a stylus. But what in a book of divination might have interested Confucius so much and so late in his life, and interested him enough that he may have composed a commentary on it, if he ever did that. As Lecker points out, the critical thing about the changes is that it was never designed as a way of magically fortune-telling the future, simply as future. And I like this quote, if like I ever said it, I didn't look it up, but this is what I really like from this section. As Lega points out, the critical thing about the changes is that it was never designed as a way of magically foretelling the future, simply as future. Its purpose was rather to determine whether certain courses of action would prove to be successful in the future, a method similar to, but much more systemized than the use of Shang had made of their torture shells oracles. In effect, its purpose was to determine and record potentially efficacious and appropriate courses of action. Okay, I confess I had to, to look up how to pronounce that word efficacious. I had never heard of it. 
<clears throat> and I like this idea that the divination and I Ching wasn't really used to predict the future, but was mainly used to determine and record potentially efficacious and appropriate courses of action. Of course, themes of a moral, social and political character alone would likely have been enough to arouse Confucius interest, but the fact that the Duke of Zhao was supposed to have written a commentary on the text is certainly what would have convinced him to spend extra time with the book. Um, I'm not sure of that. It seems to me that Schiller is also somewhat convinced that Confucius did study the I Ching, or at least knew about the book, simply because the Duke of Zhao was supposed to have written the line texts of the Zhao Yi. Um, but that, as an argument, I don't find that really convincing, considering what we have already seen before, that the ideas of Confucius, how he looked upon spirits, um, that doesn't really connect with the, the, the contents of the, of the Tao Yi. But anyway, in any case, Confucius' respect for the wisdom of the ancients was such that it seems unlikely that he would have completely excluded changes from his teachings, though indeed he may have been doing just that with his outward condemnation of divination in Analects 13, uh, paragraph 22. Um, being primarily concerned with researching and rationally organizing the rules for felic felicitous Oh, difficult words. Human relations, he may initially have regarded the changes as just a 500 year old book on divination, to be respected perhaps, but not necessarily for predicting the future, as in his view, the rules, Li, were already adequate to this task. Despite the musings of the Xuanzhui school, Nowhere in the Analects does Confucius show any special interest in the occult, only once seeming to comment directly on the supernatural, and only once seeming to react to it. In any case, he rarely liked to talk about unusual things or spiritual beings. So if he didn't really like to talk about that, um, then it also wouldn't make much sense if he studied the Zhao Yi. So, um, so that is part of the reason why I personally also don't think that uh, he he was involved with uh, with, with with the book um, because it's just something that was too far away from his own thoughts and opinions. So well, anyway, Dennis Schiller, then uh, David Schiller continues saying that literally the text of this paragraph from the Analects reads, add me more, some, add me some years, 50 in order to study, then ye, or change ye, more about that in the next sentence, maybe not big faults. In the Lou version, and this is what Richard Red also said, the Lou version of the Lun Yu contains the particle ye, meaning then, also, moreover, however, etc. So the received text of the Lun Yu contains the character Yi for the I Ching, but the Lu version of the Analects, which was uh, actually found um, somewhere at the beginning, I think, of the Han Dynasty, actually quite early, does not contain the character Yi, but this character Yi, which is pronounced the same way, but has a different meaning. And already the Han scholar Zhang Xuan already mentioned that. Um, and he said that the, the text, uh, the analects that at his time, that we have followed, that is also the received text, follows the, the Gu version, the ancient version. So that is what Schiller is talking about this these two characters, which are pronounced in the same way. So, um, in this case, Confucius, as someone who is passionate about studying, might have been saying, for 50 years I have been studying. After that, I will be free of major errors. And Schiller adds, 
between brackets, claiming that this that it is the completion of his study of I Ching which will present, prevent him from making errors such as he had been making in the past. I'm not sure why Sheila says that because there's nothing in this different translation that claims that uh, Confucius was talking about the I Ching. After all, in this translation he has swapped the character for the I Ching for this other character which is pronounced Yi. So the he isn't really referenced anymore in this paragraph, so I don't. I'm not sure why Schiller is saying this, but but it could also mean, in a more sage-like manner, we are uh, here now in well, you know, in the text. Uh, Add to my life a few more years until I have had fifty in which to study. By that means, ye, I will have remained free from major errors. Claiming that he has made no major errors during the time in which he has been studying. This is the tag following the Ding Zhao version taken by Ames and Roseman. So Ames and Roseman also translated the Analects. And they follow this alternative reading in which the character Yi is replaced by this other character Yi. Whoops. <coughs> so um, which, uh, as Rudd already said, is the accepted view nowadays. So, um, alternately, the character Yi can mean either change or easy. If it means easy, moving the comma backwards, so actually what Schiller is doing here, he is changing the grammar a little bit in the sentence, moving the comma in the sentence backwards, Although there weren't commas in in these in classical Chinese texts, uh, for ease of reading, com commas of, are often added. The translation might be: For fifty years I have been studying. It is thus easy to be free from major errors, boasting about his moral skills, or without moving the comma. It could mean: For fifty years I have been studying leisurely, which is the character Yi easy and can now be free from major errors claiming that he has been taking his time but now everything has turned out all right but these translations these two uh, suggestions are not really convincing however the Gu version reads the character Yi with the meaning change which is the primary reason that the commentators claim that this intellect is referring to the changes in which case the text might be referring to Analects to paragraph 4 and be saying, according to Legge, in a few more years I will be 50 and will have finished studying the E, the changes, when I may be without great faults. And this is actually how this other modern Chinese scholar also considers the, this paragraph. In a few more years I will be 50. So. Um, Legge's alternate translation has, if some years were added to my life, I would give 50 to the study of the Yi, and then I might come to be without great faults. So, this hopeful comment is thus presumed by Zhu Xi to have occurred after Confucius had returned to Lu, when he was close to 70 years old. But it would indeed have been a bit disingenuous of Confucius at that age to be asking to live for 50 more years, even though it would certainly demonstrate high praise for the changes. As a solution to this difficulty, Josie notes one commentator who claimed to have seen a copy of the Lun Yu in which suppose, grant, or bestow the character Jia had been substituted for add to Jia, yeah, another character which is pronounced in the same way but has a different meaning, and finish has been substituted for 50. And in this case the text would read, grant me some more years in which to finish studying the changes, then I could be free from major faults. So, uh, so these are different readings of um, the same sentence and uh, different readings uh, that are um, made by swapping certain characters with other characters. So, um, but anyway, these are um, actually quite old views, traditional views on the on this paragraph, uh, in which the 
the um, proponents still believe that Confucius studied the I Ching. So, well, uh, Schiller is also referring to an, um, um, a, ch a chapter or part from the Mawang Dwei I Ching, the important points, the Yao, uh, what is it, um, um, a, a, a appendix, um, a chapter, whatever, an addendum, addendum to the Mawang Dwei text of the changes. And this is a text um, in which Confucius is actually uh, constantly being quoted as, as using and knowing the I Ching. And he says about the changes, and we are here now, he says, the master said, as for the changes, I put the prayers and the divination aside. And what I look for is the moral power and the doing of whatever realizes dynamic harmony in the given circumstances. I just look for the moral power, that's all. I go along with the court reco recorders and the magicians, but I end up in a very different place. So this is from the Yao um, section from the Mawang Dwei I Ching, which has been translated by Edward Chaunasi. And in this uh, part of the Mawang Dwei I Ching, this commentary actually, uh, Confucius is constantly being um, quoted as, as, as using the, the, the Zhao Yi. And um, how reliable is that chapter? Well, uh, this, this, this other Chinese scholar, um, which article I briefly mentioned, who says, well, no one has been able to refute um, this idea, the, 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 the usefulness of this Yao chapter and the fact that it refers to Confucius. This scholar believes that since the Yao chapter talks about Confucius, it proves that Confucius knew and studied the I Ching. But in this commentary, uh, Confucius uh, is quoted so often, and also in the Da Zhuan, uh, Confucius is quoted very, uh, quite often. And that doesn't correspond with the Lun Yu, in which Confucius is only, um, if, if we follow the traditional reading, in which Confucius is only um, referring to the I Ching just, just once. That's this, this paragraph about these 50 years, etc. If Confucius really used the I Ching so much as the Da Zhuan is claiming and this Yao chapter from the Mao Dwei I Ching, then why does, doesn't the Lun Yu talk more about Confucius using and studying the I Ching? It, it doesn't really match. And um, it was quite common practice when you wrote something and when you wanted to um, um, advocate your and spread your ideas on a certain topic, you linked it to someone famous who preferably was dead so that he couldn't object. So many texts are attributed to Confucius. And the same goes, for instance, with Plum Blossom numerology with Mai Hua Yushu, which is attributed to Xiao Yong, who probably didn't have anything to do with it. But if you invented something new, if you had certain new ideas, they were only accepted when you were able to link them to something old, to old persons. So, uh, the fact that this Yao chapter from the Mawang Dwei Ching refers to Kong Zhe, to Confucius, that, uh, to the master, that doesn't really mean anything, especially not because the, the Mawang Dwei Ching was written quite long after Confucius uh, lived. So, um, anyway, that's about the Mawang Dwei version. And um, we were actually here. And these pages, I didn't find them very, very interesting to quote. If you want to read them, 
uh, pause the video, that should work. And the last part of this uh, presentation is actually a little digression, but I found it too beautiful not to mention it. So, um, Zhu Xi and Lu Zhu Chen, in fact, make extensive use throughout their collection of Confucian references, translated as Reflections on Things at Hand, Ye Jin Su Lu. Of they um, they uh, refer to the I Ching as a learning potential of the hexagrams of the I Ching, and extensively quoting the commentaries of Zhao Dun Yi, Cheng Hao, Cheng Yi, and Zhang Zai. Um, you, uh, if you're anyway uh, anywhere interested in the I Ching, you should try to get a hold of this book, which has been translated by Wing Chit Chan, I think. Just look for the title, Reflections on Things at Hand, because it's actually an anthology of Neo-Confucianism, and it uh, divides uh, the qu certain quotes from the I Ching and the commentary written to, uh, by, to, by uh, Cheng Yi and these other Confucian scholars, divided by topic. And it shows how the Neo-Confucianists uh, looked at the I Ching and how they used the I Ching to um, talk about topics of, uh, uh, concerning society, concerning living in general. So um, it's a beautiful book. I'm afraid it's not cheap at the moment, um, but just try to look for it, Reflections on Things at Hand. There's also a more or less a sequel to it, which is called Further Reflections on Things at Hand, translated by someone else whose name I can't recall. But anyway, that's a very interesting book uh, to have on your shelf. So... Um, so um, the Jin Su Lu uses the I Ching uh, to, to talk about these topics on, of uh, society. Zhu Xi, of course, claimed that divination by means of torture cells and yarrow stalks was fundamental to understanding the changes and an essential part of self-cultivation. Cheng Yi, however, had earlier said it was really a discussion concerning optimally efficacious behaviors, Li. Wang Bi thought that every hexagram embodied its own standard meaning and that only that particular meaning should be studied and practiced in relation to that hexagram. Eventually, Wang Yangming was able to reconcile these ideas by explaining that, like the poetry of the Xu Jing, the meanings were not standard after all but must be applied in the context of the reader-diviner and that the meanings would thereby produce different manifestations depending on the circumstances. And this is why I like the work of Wang Yangming so much, because he has this very practical view of divination. And he says that a hexagram in itself can only have a particular meaning uh, when it is linked to the person who is consulting the oracle and who is actually receiving that specific hexagram. It should be connected to the circumstances or, if you want, the question that this person has uh, is asking. So, And uh, that is something I, I, I really uh, can relate to um, because um, a hexagram in itself uh, you could say it doesn't really have any meaning because it has too much meaning um, if you if you can't connect it to any situation. The same goes for Chinese characters. A Chinese character in itself, without any context, can have so many meanings. And to find out which meaning is actually relevant, you have to know the context. So... I often get this question about what does this character mean? And I always have to ask, what is the context? And there is always context. So and the same goes for an answer from the I Ching. An answer from the I Ching in itself 
uh, doesn't have meaning. It gets its meaning from the context uh, to which it is applied uh, or for which it is consulted. So, um, and then Schiller quotes Wang Yang Ming. And I really like this quote. Um, Divination involves principle, which is protocol for optimally efficacious behaviors. And principle is a form of divination. I'm not happy with that a form. And we see, uh, I'm, I will repeat this quote later on, and then uh, we will see again this this addition of a, f a form of divination. No, it's the text, the original text from Wang Yangming says that principle is divination period. Because later generations regard divination as fundamentally fortune-telling, they look upon it as petty, cra petty craft. They don't know that questions and answers between teachers and friends, such as we are engaging in today, and quoting from the Zhong Yong, is studying extensively, inquiring accurately, thinking carefully, sifting clearly, practicing earnestly, and the like. They are all divination. Divination is no more than to remove doubt and to give the mind divine intelligence. I'm going to repeat that quote later in from the original book of Wang Yangming. Wang is really talking, says Schiller, about carefully checking into what is really there as opposed to what is not. Defining, Wang says, is one way of understanding what optimally efficacious human behavior Li is. He thereby redefines divination as something akin to Plato's dialectic. Oh, I have no idea. I'm not familiar with that. But anyway, and thus may be supporting my suggestion concerning Confucius' use of changes as a complex teaching tool for generating discussion about moral and political questions. So it seems that Schiller is still convinced that Confucius did use the changes, but he's actually an exception. Um, Wang's melding of the Shangs and the Zhao's defining of spirits with a method for critically examining the world based on the Zhong Yong was nothing short of brilliant. Oh, I so much agree. <laughs> for this move definitely reconciled popularized versions of fortune telling the future, rejected by Confucius in I Jing in the Yao part from the Ma Wang Zui version, as quoted above, and also when he recommends keeping ghosts and other spiritual beings at a distance. Fortune-telling is also rejected by Xunzi, and as do both Cheng Yi's and Zhu Xi's versions of the use of changes for purposes of self-cultivation. So, as Adler explains, it's, we're here. Yi Jing divination as Neo-Confucians understood it, is only indirectly or secondarily concerned with fortune-telling. It is really more about apprehending the present, or the direction and character of the present flow of events, and choosing one's course of action to best fit into and make use of the energy of that flow. When hexagram is derived through the manipulation of yarrow stalks, it is conceived as an image or reading. Well, no, not reading, just it's conceived as an image of that current dynamic situation. And uh, again, we see here that uh, this, uh, this Adler um, links fortune, uh, links the I Ching, div links divination to the present and not to this idea of foretelling the future. Consulting the I Ching has to do with the here and now. And that is something that I uh, totally agree with. So, I really liked that quote from Wang Yang Ming. So I'm going to repeat it and um, in, in its original context from Wang Yang Ming's work and the complete, give you the complete quote which starts there. So this is from the actual work from Wang Yingming, which has been translated as 
instructions for practical living. If you look for that title, I'm sure you will find it. It's from he, the Zhuan Shi Lu from Wang Yangming. And a student asked him, press that button, there we are. And um, a student asked him, Zhu Xi considers divination by means of torture cells and stalks of plants as fundamental, while Zhang Yi in his commentary considers principle as fundamental. What do you think? And, and this, I, I really like this answer from Wang Yangming. The teacher said, divination involves principle and principle is divination. Among the principles in the world, is there any greater than that of divination? Because later generations regard divination as fundamentally fortune-telling, they look upon it as petty craft. They don't know that questions and answers between teachers and friends, such as we are engaging in today, yes, we, you, the viewer, watching my video and I, making this video, video, such as we are engaging in today and studying extensively, inquiring accurately, thinking carefully, sifting clearly, practicing earnestly and the like, are all divination. Divination is no more than to remove doubt and to give the mind divine intelligence. The Book of Changes seeks answers from heaven. Man has doubts and does not have sufficient self-confidence. He therefore seeks answers from heaven by use of the Book of Changes. The idea that the human mind involves some selfish desires. The, the idea is that the human mind involves some selfish desires. Heaven alone leaves no room for falsehood. I don't really like the translation from the last sentence from this paragraph from Wang Yangming. Um, so I gave my own version, and we're talking about the green part uh, here. Um, I, I prefer to translate it as the human mind heart desires to yao so shi. And um, we have in the text, we have this character Shang. And that's what we have already seen that character in the first examples video, in which it means that there's a certain wish that's um, used to introduce the, the prayer to the oracle. So it has to do with a desire, a wish. So um, the people's heart or mind or heart mind uh, um, desires to yao so shi. And so means that uh, a place, a certain location, and sure, although the normal meaning is to wade through a, a river, to cross a river, in with the, when it comes to location, to places, it means that you want to go there, you want to uh, go through there. So I personally thought it more had to do with experience. You mind heart desires to have experiences. And only heaven does not tolerate what is false. So that is um, what I think Wang Yangming is trying to say here, that by um, as a humans, we want to experience the world. Uh, we want to engage in it. But we also want to know what is true, what is valid, what is useful, and what isn't. And Wang Yangming is saying that the Book of Changes can help you to achieve that, to differentiate between what is false and what is true. So um, maybe the Book of Changes, the I Ching, is the red pill, I think, or is it the blue pill? I can't remember. From the Matrix, it's the pill that helps you to get out of the matrix and um, realize, make you realize what is actually true, what is real, 
uh, instead of what is false and what is not real. But I also like this idea that he says, you know, divination, it's the same as asking questions and uh, uh, talking with your teacher and talking, uh, having conversations with your friends, having conversations with your friends and having this, these, these dialogues and these exchanges, that is divination. And I really, I really like that view because, and th that is what I like about Wang Yang Ming. He makes it so practical, so down to earth. He keeps it simple. And um, that, is, uh, that is why I'm, I'm really fond of Wang Yang Ming's work. So I would like to um, uh, finish this video with um, um, a part from um, Gao Zhenlong, which is in the spirit of Wang Yang Ming and also inspired by the Da Zhuan. The Yi works without boundaries. Diminished, it probes the finest details. Enlarged, it covers everything. It knows heaven and it perceives earth. It teaches those below and guides those above. If it was not imbued with inner knowledge of what is good, Yang Zhe, how could it do this? Says Gao. Long. Thank you for watching and um, see you in the next video. Bye.